Boy, we a lot of participants tonight. Mike Cornforth, and I think most of you know me, I'm the coordinator for Indivisible Port Townsend, and I'm also the host here. I haven't done a lot of these meetings before, so my inexperience may show. Uh, let me go over real quickly what the agenda is for tonight. Uh, I'll make a few remarks as I've already started. After I make those remarks, Cheryl Bentley uh, will talk with us about methods to reach voters uh, while we're having to shelter. That'll take maybe 15 to 20 minutes. And then following that, the team leader briefs will occur. Those will be approximately five minutes long. We'll have foreign policy with Gina and then immigration with either John or Kath, uh, Kathleen. I'm not sure who's speaking for them. And finally, elections again with Renee is going to talk to us a little bit about the Senate races. If we finish all those, then at 5.40 p.m., we'll be joined by Gail Tarleton, who is the Democratic candidate for Secretary of State, who's agreed to speak with us for 15 to 20 minutes. If we haven't finished the team briefs, uh, then we will finish that afterwards. Uh, I need to tell everybody that we intend to have an all member Zoom meeting, uh, just like we always did to have our big huddle. So the next one will be at 5 p.m. on the 11th of August. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and make a few remarks. How many of us have actually gone to a protest demonstration since the terrible events in Minneapolis? <laughs> Okay, I, you know, I can just tell by looking at the video here that we are <laughs> in a somewhat vulnerable demographic for uh, COVID-19. So I don't want to tell you not to go, but please go and wear a mask and do the social distancing required. That means six feet. And if people are really yelling and shouting a lot, you may want to get a little further away than that. Um, we want everybody to stay self, safe and healthy, specifically so that you can vote for this gentleman in November. So that's it on protest bit. Um, Cheryl, I'm going to turn it over to you if I can find you on the screen. There you are. And Cheryl's going to share her screen. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm. Uh, I work with the elections committee, and you. You know, we all know how important getting the vote out uh, for this election, so we can elect Biden. We can take back the Senate, and hopefully keep the House. So, uh, and there's all those important um, elections within our own state. So we thought we would. Um, Give you some information on ways that you can get involved in getting out the vote. Um, so this is the first uh, one of six uh, groups or activities that you could uh, participate in. First one called Common Power. You may have heard it as Common Purpose. They just changed their name recently. And the thing that's really interesting about this, because a lot of these groups are doing similar things, but there's always a little twist. And they send teams of people to states to mobilize voters. And, um, and, it's and then they create new leaderships using young people and, um, and partnering with local organizations. Um, so we have one of our members, Ed Shapiro, who uh, has participated in this group. And Ed, would you like to say a few words about uh, your experience? I think you said it all. <laughs> no, um, well, let me see. Uh, a lady named Peggy pr gave a presentation to our election group um, back in February. And I've always been interested in traveling to a state to um, you know, help get out the vote or voter ID, all that stuff. And so I went to Common Power, Common Purpose. I went to their introductory workshop in Seattle. There were about 200 people there. Um, 
mostly our age. And then they had these young, <clears throat> young people that, that are organizers. Anyway, they, they send 20 people to battleground or toss up states um, to partner with a local organization. And, but anyway, um, so I was really looking forward to doing that, but they're not doing that because of COVID now. So their fallback is what, what all the other groups are doing, phone calls to, uh, and postcards and maybe letters to, um, to help people or to encourage people to, to, you know, get their abs do their absentee ballots. Um, They've also, uh, they also are calling to these states that, you know, are making it tough to, to do the absentee ballot. Um, and I mean, even though we're from out of state, they're still, they're still making those calls. And I guess they've had some success. They're, they're based out of Washington, out of Seattle. The, the leader of the group is, um, uh, um, a professor at the University of Washington, and in addition to um, into the all the stuff that they do as an organization, he also does lectures uh, um, on relevant topics, and he's, he's really learned. Um, be, before I end, um, they have every Monday from twelve o'clock twelve. 12 to 1 p.m., they have an introduction to common power. And it, it goes, oh, you, 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 meet, you meet these people. Um, it's a Zoom call. And, uh, and if you're at all interested, I'd encourage you to, you know, check the, to get on that Zoom call, check it out. Um, it's just one of, one of many. Uh, things that we, you know, you know, it might appeal to somebody. It might, uh, an indivisible might appeal to somebody else. Blah blah blah. So anyway, that's it. That's. If you got All any right. Questions, let me know. Thank you, Ed. And and um, I'm on my screen. It's a little cut off, so I'm not sure if it is on anybody else's. But there's um, a website for this, as there will be with each one of them. It's commonpower.org. So if you're yeah. interested, that's what that's who you contact. Thank you, Ed. You're welcome. Oh, hey, by the way, keep try if you, if that takes you to something else, keep trying. I I tried it before this call, and it took me to, I mean, I um, took me someplace else. Keep keep trying. M maybe type in the www first, um, or just go to Common Purpose. You probably get it that way. Yeah, too. that's true too. Yep. Okay, well, thank you, Ed. The next one is called Postcards to Voters, and some of you might notice as Tony the Democrat. And these are, as they say, friendly handwritten reminders to targeted voters. And um, Karen Rudd, um, Karen has participated, and I, I can see the website on my screen. It's postcards to voters.org. Karen, would you like to say a few words as to why you think this is a valuable group to work with? Sure. You can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I started doing postcards to voters maybe three years ago. And um, what appealed to me is that they wanted to do handwritten postcards. And I uh, do calligraphy as strange hobby. And so I thought it was a way to put those two things together. But they really appreciate uh, kind of a creative touch. And so if you have a, a bit of artist in you, it's a good way to use those skills. They send you, it's pretty slick, they send you um, the addresses of the number of voters that you request, um, something like 10 or 20 at a time. And you can either get it on your phone via an app or they'll email it to you. And uh, you have to be pre-approved to be a writer. So you just, you do an example to prove that you can follow their instructions and then you take a photo of it and you send it to them. But after that, it's really easy. And that actually isn't all that difficult either. Um, so what they do is they are um, 
you're writing to individual voters, encouraging them to show up for close races. So similar to that is the next one. Did you want to talk about vote forward? It's not the next one on here. Okay. Well, that's my experience with postcard to voters. It's actually pretty fun. It's my favorite. Actually, you know what? We we don't have vote forward because we I, we didn't in our group have anybody who was working on it. But if you want to say something about vote, vote forward, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, so vote forward is another one of these similar deals. This one, um, you this one requires you to have a printer at your home. And they send you the addresses of voters. And this is prepping everybody to do a big push of mailings out for the November election. So you're getting everything ready, but you're not going to send it out until I think. Oh, Karen, I'm sorry. Vote forward is on here. And I have somebody else who's going to be talking about it, too. I apologize. I was thinking of another group. Can I stop you right there for just a second? I'm sorry. You are going to speak, up? and there's another person who's going to speak on that one. I apologize. Let them finish up. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so they send you the addresses, and you print them out, and you have to stick them in an envelope. So, uh, you know, postcard to voters is a little less expensive because you get to just use a postcard stamp. And, yeah. I don't know. Maybe somebody else has something great to say about it, but. Roger was going to speak on it. I am so sorry. I, yeah, I, didn't hear I, just, I just think the important thing is that if you don't have a printer, don't sign up for Vote Forward. Well, that's good information to have. Thank you. Sure. Okay. The next one is called Reclaim Our Vote. And this is actually one that I've been involved with. In. And also Norton Corrin, one of our members, Norton couldn't be here today, but he wrote a statement that he wanted me to read to you. So here goes. It says, this is work I feel really good about. Claim Our Vote sends out monthly status reports showing how many people are participating and how many postcards have been sent. They also monitor results and indicate that approximately 25% of those receiving our postcards have taken the action requested in the postcards. It is a great feeling to know the work I'm doing is getting results. So that was from Norton, and I just want to say that uh, I would ditto what Norton has said. And regarding those statistics, in June, there were over 2,400 postcard writers around the U.S., and since January, over 200,000 postcards have been written and sent. I heard about this group through a friend in late March, and she gave me an email address to, to contact uh, a team leader named Jim, who's actually in California. He sent me a list of 30 names and addresses and a script. And when I finished the first group of 30 names, he sent me another 30. Since the end of March, I have now written over 400 postcards. And, and it's easy. I love doing this activity because I feel like it makes a difference. I especially appreciate the fact that we are reaching thousands of people of color, letting them know how they, know that they are possibly deregistered or we're providing polling information or just encouraging them to vote. And I didn't mention that we Reclaim Our Vote focuses on sending postcards to people of color. And they're uh, mainly in the South. I've written to North Carolina and Texas uh, and Georgia. And the person who started this group, this is a campaign through the Center for Common Ground, come from Virginia. And um, I just wanted to say in March, there were less than 1,000 uh, postcard writers. And now there's over 2,400. So if you want to be a part of this group, you can contact me. And my email address is on our PT Indivisible website under elections. And my name is Cheryl Bentley. Okay, the next one. I'm sorry, here it is again, Karen. Vote forward. And they describe their uh, group as a letter writing to progressive-leaning, unregistered, and low-propensity voters, encouraging them to vote. And it, that what they say is you write the letters now and mail them in October. Roger, can you tell us a little bit more about the, uh, your experience with Vote Forward? Yeah, I, I've really enjoyed it, and, and it's a lot like the postcards, I guess. Uh, in the sense, you can do it anytime you want to do it, and, and it's really, uh, convenient. Uh, getting some other noise from somewhere. So 
somebody's yeah we're hearing it roger <laughs> okay I don't, um anyway uh it um well they give you uh, you do need the printer and i hadn't really thought about the fact it's not available uh that little space that i'm pointing to in here is all you have to write <laughs> but you print out a letter and dear blank and you fill in the name and and then it says and and i've enjoyed this part um i vote in every election because and then it leaves it up to you to say why it is you're doing it and then it goes on afterwards saying there's going to be an election uh, i hope you'll go vote um but I, I keep kind of rephrasing things and changing them around but it makes me feel like i'm really talking to a person to an individual uh, i don't know that i get more easily involved in it i guess um and and i personalize a little bit if you will i i play the gender card uh, if it's a, a woman uh, that I'm writing, I mentioned that my grandmother didn't know, didn't have the right to vote. And uh, so I'm honoring those people that gave my grandmother the right to vote. And it, it, maybe it'll, you know, tweak somebody who's in their 30s and, and thought about the fact that, you know, back then. Anyway, uh, you do need to, it's a little more expensive. You need an envelope. Uh, you need a paper to go through the computer. You need a stamp for a first class uh, mail. So there's that uh, downside. Uh, they, uh, they claim uh, that, that they make a, a several percentage point difference in who actually shows up, that they've done blind studies, uh, if you will, following voters, and some them sent letters to others that they did not at all contact. And uh, and they in places like Florida, where I've been spending most of my time, uh, a couple of percent would would have been a difference. Anyway, uh, they do the same kinds of things that others do, uh, sending to uh, either of two sets you could pick, uh, le leaning Democratic or uh, just underrepresented. Uh, these are all people who are. Uh, uh, registered voters they have another program that is to get people to register um, and uh, anyway anybody who wants to, to chat about it uh, feel free to, to drop me a note I'll be glad to, to talk to somebody uh, Roger Anderson and uh, you got vote has a lot of information on the site thank you thank you Roger okay so here's something new that's happening through Indivisible, and it's called Unity Week of Action, and Debbie is going to talk about that. Yay! Well, first of all, I want to tell you, Cheryl, sorry about this, but as of uh, Sunday, they changed the name of it to Win Divisible, W-I-N-D-I-V-I-S-I-B-L-E, Win Divisible. So I'm really excited about uh, putting a group together that wants to be part of Win Divisible. And I just want to tell you our goal, like the goal of Indivisible, is to defeat Trump, flip the Senate, and keep the House. So uh, the Win Divisible plan is to uh, contact 20 million voters, direct contact. We need 30,000 volunteers. And uh, this program is going to be 100% digital. So uh, it's already starting. A, there's a, they're going to be targeting 18 states. And I went to a, a Wind Divisible meeting yesterday and was very excited about the possibilities. And I'm going to try to talk Mado into uh, helping me. <laughs> and um, uh, there's three parts to this. There's a peer-to-peer -peer texting. So it's a digital tools and you do it from your computer. So it isn't from your phone, it's from your computer. Uh, and you text uh, people and there's a scripts that we have and it's easy, effective, it's private, it's fast, it's fun. And especially if you're um, a, what's that word when you're not like me? Um, uh, introvert? It's a great, it's a great job for an introvert because you don't really have to talk to anybody. You're just texting and you text them and then you can come back at the end of the day. You can text them in the morning, come back at the end of the day and just respond to the text. So it's really, uh, and there's tons of training. Uh, they're also doing phone banking. 
with something called Hub Dialer and um, Mado and I, I think we, Mado, didn't we use Hub Dialer? Um, but we've not done it before and it's kind of automatically yeah. calls and it's again on your computer. So it's very easy and uh, do it from your home anytime. And then the last part of it is handwritten letters and postcards. And they're using Vote Forward as part of that handwriting, uh, handwritten letter part. And like Roger, I've been doing it for a while and uh, I've written 80 letters so far. And you do have to pay for an envelope, a stamp, and, and, um, printing. and printing. So anyway, I just want to tell you, I'm very excited about When the Visible. I hope many of you will join me. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, a, a When the Visible event in Bashan on Thursday, and it's called Resistance Cafe. And they'll be meeting every Thursday from 3 to 5, and people will come, and they'll assign them people to text and call. And you go off and you do it, and then you can come back to the cafe and say, oh, well, that didn't work, or I was successful, I contacted 47 people. And it's just a way for us to all stay together and work together. And, you know, one of my big pushes, if it's not fun, don't do it. But anyway, so please expect to have more information about when we're going to do it. Our first week is July 22nd, 7th to August 2nd, which is, a hundred days before the election, actually 99, but we're going to just say a hundred days before the election. So that's why they picked that date for the kickoff. And if you're interested in joining me and, and um, helping me to put together a group of people that wants to do this, um, my, my email is also on um, our beautiful new website. And um, it's Deborah K. Steele at gmail.com. Or you can also find me on the Indivisible Port Townsend Facebook page. Um, so anyway, that's it, Cheryl. Thank you for letting me talk about when divisible. Thank you, Debbie. We love your enthusiasm. <laughs> me <too>. So <laughs> the, the last of the six that we're, we're, we're talking about today is uh, the Washington Democrats. And Diane... Uh, it, and it, it says it right there. They're making calls to low propensity voters for whom there is insufficient data, but they're also going to be doing get out the vote calls. Diane, can you tell us why you're doing this and why you find, think it's important? Are you there, Diane? She might be on mute. Uh, Mike, can you see her? Hey, does that work better? There you are, Diane. Oh, boy. Yeah. Okay. We can hear Yay. you. Okay. So I'm doing this because I want to get Democrats elected. And, and to me, getting Biden elected and, and winning the Senate majority is a top priority. I can't tell you how happy I will be when that day happens. Keeping a majority in the House is also important, and while that may not be an issue in 2020, it could become an issue in following elections. There are currently 21 Republican state government trifectas and only 15 Democratic trifectas. Unless that changes, we could be in trouble as state legislatures are involved in redistricting. These are working hard to break up the Republican trifectas in the 2020 elections, especially in states where, we are, where there are important Senate races. Washington State is one of 15 Democratic state trifectas. These are working hard to increase our hold on state government. Just to mention a few of the important efforts in that regard, in L Legislative District 25 in Pierce County, we are trying to flip all three legislative seats to blue. In LD 26, which includes Southern Kitsap, we successfully flipped a Senate seat in 2018, and that was no easy feat. This year we are trying to flip, replace the, uh, the two house seats and we have two great candidates. In LD19 to the south of, south of us, we are trying to replace a very right wing bombastic gun rights supporter, Jim Walsh. In LD17, we are working to flip a house seat. LD17 is also in Congressional District 3, which we are trying to flip and get Carolyn Long elected to Congress. And one of the best ways to make this happen is, is contacting voters directly. And the state party is sponsoring phone banks most every night. And I put the link in the comment section, which is a little different than what's up here. 
And so, because uh, the link I, I put in the comment section takes you directly to it, and you scroll down, and you can see all the, the nights and opportunities that you have. They also they have two ways of doing it. They use through talk, which cover you can make a lot of phone calls in one hour. I don't particularly enjoy that method. I prefer the virtual phone banks. It's easier. It's, I can dial each number myself and then set my own pace, and I much prefer it. But each each person likes different 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 strokes for different folks. But there is another important reason why we're doing this. Our state has huge budget shortfalls and a grim economic lookout. And we got to do our best to avoid austerity. And there are ways to replace lost revenue and fix our regressive tax structure so we can avoid austerity. And but we it would sure help if we had more progressive and larger majorities to help us get there. And that's what phone banking is all about. And that is the most important thing you can do in the state and probably other states if they also. So that's that's my spiel. Diane, thank you so much. And thank you for all the work you're doing here in Washington. It's much appreciated. So the election, 2020, it's not just the, the national, it's all the various elections that are going on. And now you have the tools to increase voter turnout. Pick one of these activities to make a difference in the all the various elections. And if you have any questions about, uh, you know, any of these, you like, like Debbie said, you know, we've got a website. You can go to the website and get more information. Well, we went over our 15 minutes, so we don't have any time for questions right now, but maybe at the end if there are. And I just wanted to say that um, if you know of some other groups that you think are really good, let me know because maybe we can include that in the next uh, um, uh, all-member uh, uh, meeting that we have. So I'm going to stop my sharing. And thank you all. Thank you very much, Cheryl. That was very interesting, and I think very informative. Uh, I'm not. I don't see uh, Gail coming up. So what I'd like to now do is go on to uh, Gina McMather, who will give us a brief on where we are in foreign policy. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, with all the focus on elections and the coronavirus and everything else, somehow world events are kind of getting uh, left in the background. Um, but our group is, is determined that uh, it won't get totally swept under the rug. And we're trying to influence our legislators uh, and demonstrate that people are, in fact, paying attention to global issues and um, national our, our national standing in global affairs. Uh, our, our last meeting last week, uh, we looked at a lot of things happening around the world, uh, conflict at various levels, some diplomatic issues, national security things, uh, and many of them fall into the category that I decided to call IAM situations, which is it's a mess and <laughs> we're not the people to try to do something about it it's beyond our pay grade. Uh, but uh, they are issues that we hope will be addressed by our new administration. And so, of course, the elections are terribly important. There are a couple things that after discussing the various events that we had thought to talk about uh, that we want to act upon. Now, uh, about two weeks ago, we sent out a an action blast to the members uh, to email our members of Congress about the administration's attack, uh, attacks on our international broadcast network. Okay, that's the, the umbrella organization is the U.S. Agency for, for Global Media, USAGM, and the Trump administration um, put in a new guy, one of their Trump people, uh, and this involves the... Um, Radio Free Europe, Voice of America, Radio Free Asia, yeah. Middle East Broadcasting Network, Office of Cuba Broadcasting, and the Open Technology Fund. And after there, the new guy, Michael Pack, got put in a couple of days, within a couple of days, he fired all the existing heads of all those agencies, and they're putting in uh, senior people and directors that are Trump loyalists. So you have to wonder if, if Trump is trying to turn these respected international broadcast networks 
into his own personal propaganda network. Uh, so uh, anyway, we did that as, an, as a blast, uh, and we're going to go ahead and, and also contact more uh, congress, congressmen and women uh, about that. Uh, Elliot Engel, yes. Okay. What? Uh, I noticed that Gail is now okay. available to join us. Uh, I would like to introduce us all to Gail Tarleton. She is the, can the Democratic candidate running for Secretary of State, has a very strong background in national security and in security matters in general. And uh, I would like to have you, Gail, uh, tell us why you're running for Secretary of State. And uh, we've allotted some time for you to take questions from our membership. As you can see, there's about 35 of us here. All right, Gail, it's your show. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, so much for the opportunity to get together with all of you. I uh, want to thank the 24th District uh, Chair, who's also online tonight, and all of you who have been so extraordinary in this most extraordinary of election seasons. So for those I haven't met yet in person, I am Gail Tarleton. Uh, for those I haven't met on video, I am running for Secretary of State. I am really honored to be able to serve the 36th legislative district in our state house. I was elected in 2012. And prior to that, I was a Seattle Port Commissioner. And I was a Port Commissioner for five years uh, here to work on saving our working waterfront and work on how we were going to recover from the last recession. That was terrific work and it prepared me for dealing with the kinds of stresses and strains and crises that we are in right now. I visited most of the ports in Washington State. There are 75 public ports when I was a port commissioner, and that is what gave me a full grounding in how connected we are. Not how divided we are, but how connected we are and dependent on different parts of our state's critical infrastructure to be able to get our trade routes secure and to be able to make sure our wheat and our soy are going to other countries and our fish and our fruits are heading to other Asian and uh, global markets and how much we depend on those who are manufacturing here in Washington state depend on those jobs and those opportunities and livelihoods that are the bulwark of every community where we live in this state. So why am I running for Secretary of State? Because I am absolutely focused on standing up to the attacks on our voting rights, our critical infrastructure that our elections ride on, and to make sure that someone is standing up and fighting back when Donald Trump tries to take voting by mail and slap it around with no one responding. And for the last four months, that is what I have learned, is that our Secretary of State is silent in the face of all of these attacks on voting by mail and on our voting rights and on our democracy itself coming out of the president's mouth. She is silent. But guess when she's not silent? When she decides to go to Congress in 2019 and be the only state secretary that went and testified in opposition to House Resolution 1, which was the election security legislation from in which Congressman Derek Kilmer had a key piece of legislation on honest ads and honest campaign financing and getting rid of dark money. Well, she testified against the election security legislation, which would have funded vote by mail nationwide. She didn't just stop there. She signed a letter a month later to Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy, the two House leaders, re-establishing the fact that there was serious opposition among 16 Republican secretaries of state, and she was one of them who signed that letter saying, do not pass this election security legislation. It takes away too much power of state and local secretaries of state to address voting rights and voter access and how we conduct elections. If she had not testified against that legislation, but instead had used it as an opportunity to extend voting by mail to all of the states, 
where she had an influence with her Republican colleagues, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in right now. We would have already taken care of it because if she had testified in support, her Republican colleagues would not have had a leg to stand on. But instead, they have spent the last four months of this pandemic attacking voters, making them stand in line around this country for their primaries. We have our ballots coming, and I am looking forward to your questions and our discussion tonight, but our ballots are arriving this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, like tomorrow, I mean, two days from now, or Friday or Saturday, and maybe into Monday, because our postal service is still here despite Donald Trump's threats to eliminate it by election day. We need to vote and we need to turn out the vote and we need to make sure that everyone who is registered to vote recognizes the stakes in this election. I'll end with one other little piece of information that I think all of us need to know. She is not nonpartisan. She is a Republican, has been a Republican her entire career in public office, has declared as a Republican, chaired the Republican Secretaries of State Committee, for three years in 2016 to 2018. And she has never stood up to any of the attacks that her colleagues are leveling on our voting rights and voters around this country. That says everything to me. She does not have the courage to stand up and speak out when she knows our rights are under attack. That is not nonpartisan. That is power, partisan politics to the extreme. And she is not pushing forward to change the way the conversation works to make sure every vote and every voter is protected and every vote is counted regardless of party. I will be that kind of secretary of state for you. And I will address the security risks, which we can go into in Q&A because we have a few ideas. And that's one thing I have done my whole life is identified where there is risk and found ways of traveling a new path to get to a solution that people believe is in the best interest of all of us. So I look forward to the questions and discussion tonight. Thank you, Gail. Um, now, for those of you who have not done these Zoom things before, <laughs> uh, please ask questions. But the way I'm going to call on you, and I will call on you, is if you could just hold your hand up, or if you're not on video here somehow indicate to us that you have a question. All right, we're ready for questions. So who's ready? All right, Ed, unmute yourself, ask the question. Ed, there you go. Uh, yeah, I was wondering why uh, there hasn't been a Demo Democrat Secretary of State since 1964, I believe. You are correct, Ed. Maybe yeah. we could all agree that uh, in prior decades and in prior generations, since this does go through three or what you could equate to three generations at least, of every, if you account a generation as 20 years, and I, right now in the world we're in with information and, uh, and risk and global markets, I actually think of generations as more like 12 to 15 years. I think what we could all agree on is that the game changed in 2000, in 2000, for how our elections are actually conducted and what the stakes are when a Secretary of State makes a partisan call and doesn't make the call to support every vote and every voter. But it didn't trickle down to the states until what became obvious in 2016 with so much manipulation of voting po voter polls, the purging of voter polls, people being told that they had to stand in line for six hours in order to vote, and then they had to produce an identification card that they didn't have. These are the times where the, the switch flipped, Ed. And by 2016, when we had a presidential candidate in Trump inviting Putin to interfere in our elections, which he did, and which a Senate Intelligence Committee has issued an additional bipartisan report just two months ago, reaffirming that the Russians did interfere in 2016. They have been interfering since that time in the, in the midterm elections, 
and they are interfering right now in the 2020 elections. And that moment in 2016 was the turning point for everyone to understand. It actually does matter if you have a party in a leadership role running elections that can undermine voting information, voting rights, voter access, and will actively and implicitly work to suppress voter turnout. And that is why it's dangerous. And that is why we need a change in this leadership position. We can no longer afford the party position taking and prevailing against the will of the people. Gail, we've great. seen you before. You're great. Yeah. Yes, Thank you I so just, much for being here. I, I just want to say something. I, I was really disappointed in the Seattle Times when they uh, decided that they were supporting uh, Kim Wyman. Um, I'm wondering uh, what your approach is to that and how you hope to overcome that because that their, their um, recommendation, I think, is, I mean, a lot of people just look at that and go, okay, check the box. So I'm just kind of wondering how you're hoping to overcome that kind of uh, um, adversity. The Seattle Times is my uh, my hometown newspaper, uh, just like you have the Peninsula Daily News. And uh, yes, it does have a broader subscription area, uh, but the Seattle Times uh, has a history here of endorsing incumbents. It's rare when they take on an incumbent, and it's even rarer uh, that they will not endorse an incumbent who is a Republican, because the Republicans are such a vanishing breed that there is still this myth inside the Seattle Times editorial board and with the publisher, with the owner and publisher, uh, Frank Blethen, that, that there are still Dan Evans Democrat uh, Republicans out there and that those Republicans are now embodied in the very few Republicans uh, remaining around the state who are the, uh, the descendants of the Dan Evans Republicans. So Ralph Monroe was a Dan Evans Republican uh, Sam Reed was a Dan Evans Republican, and they were the predecessors to uh, Kim Wyman. And they selected, they hand selected Wyman to run for Secretary of State when their tenure, uh, when they had finished their tenure. And so I was, my team was fully prepared, and we assumed that the Seattle Times would endorse her. I took the editorial board at its word that it would take the interviews and hear both sides of the aisle. But their basic position is this. They want the Office of Secretary of State to be a nonpartisan position, just as the Superintendent of Public Instruction is, and just as the Commissioner of Public Lands is a nonpartisan position. They are okay with Democrats running, but they actually want it to be an elected office that is not uh, running on a partisan platform. And so they were going to support Kim because they think she's nonpartisan. And what I revealed to them are the three or four examples where we know she is a partisan. And if she wanted to be a nonpartisan Secretary of State, she could have declared a nonpartisan preference on the ballot. And she never has since she first ran for office in 2002 or 2004. She has always been a Republican and she is a Republican. And when she will not denounce the Republican president's attacks on our democracy and our voting rights, then she is truly a Republican. And I'm gonna win because Democrats believe that we should have the right to vote. That's how I'm gonna overcome this, Dennis. Okay. okay. <laughs> All, right. All right, any others? I see a Jackie and Bruce. Deborah. Deborah. Raise their hands. Deborah. Deborah. This is Jackie. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to make a comment that um, <laughs> your message is really powerful. And I appreciate your focus. And I'm 100% behind you. And I'm telling everyone to vote for you. <laughs> Jackie, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> It's going to take it's going to take a a tidal wave of blue voting to to take this on. I I'd like to just all let you know the very first time I ran for office was 2007 and it was a very 
uh, you know, the economy was cranking and it was fantastic. And it was a year before the recession hit, right? Before the markets crashed. But I took on a two-term incumbent port commissioner who had also served two terms on the Renton City Council. And he was very well-liked. He was a really well-liked um, elected official, a Boeing engineer. And uh, we had a six-way primary. And I won the primary by four and a half points. And I beat the incumbent in the general election by nine and a half. We know how to win in challenging an incumbent. But it really does take convincing <laughs> voters that it's okay to fire the person you formally maybe voted for that you hired and change, change the game, change the person and change the way we move forward into the future. That is the story we have to reassure voters that they have permission to not vote for someone they may have voted for before. And the whole ball game has changed and that's in my voter pamphlet statement. This job has changed. We need different expertise. I have long national security experience, expertise in protecting our country, protecting critical infrastructure. Our elections are the most critical infrastructure we have in this country because they are how we ensure that we are a democracy. And that is not just highfalutin language. That is absolutely true. And that is why I am running to protect our elections. Hey, Gail. Deborah? Thank you for that. Um, you alluded to some ideas you have for uh, security of our election in Washington. Do you want to talk about those for a minute? Yes, uh, just uh, briefly, I got legislation passed this year that I've been working on for a couple of years that we, before any elections equipment, networks, voter files, uh, voter software, new technologies can be deployed by local auditors or at the Secretary of State's office, that it must first undergo vulnerability testing as well as performance standards testing. So something like vote WA should not happen again, where you roll out a system, it's plagued with failures from day one because it was not properly tested to see if it performed according to standards and specifications. And then the second ingredient, Deborah, is to establish with a national, with a national group of experts, what are the standards that will have our election security rated in A by the election security uh, performance groups, Brennan Center and Pew and Center for American Progress all look at the states from a standpoint of the protection of their elections against cyber attacks and other security risks. We are currently ranked to C. And she likes to say we're the national model. I don't want to be the national model with a C rating for election security. I want national standards so that all of the states and legislatures know what they should be doing to get to an A. And that's, those are two of the areas that I will really work on hard. I want to thank you again, Gail, for taking your time, your important time to come talk to us. And I'm and hoping uh, what you told us will cause us the vote for you. Right. Well, me too. And and Mike, if I may, I would just like to address uh, the comments that were being made, the discussion right before we started, I think by Gina, was it, about Radio Free Europe and uh, Voice of America? Trump has made them a propaganda tool. When I was in the Defense Intelligence Agency, one of the most important sources of information were Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and Voice of America helping us understand how information about our democratic institutions and our way of life were being viewed in the Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe behind the Iron Curtain and behind the Berlin Wall. This propaganda and politicization of Radio Free Europe will be devastating. And we need to fight back even if he appoints this guy, removing the polluted parts of and corrupted parts of our institutions post-Trump is gonna be a heck of a high bar for us to all follow, but never stop fighting back against what is clearly an attempt to control freedom of information around the world. And I am really grateful to all of you for being willing to spend a gorgeous evening talking about our democracy. So I'll look forward to seeing you virtually again. And I probably can't be campaigning in person until after uh, the August time period. But tell everyone to vote, 
Get your ballots in early so that the auditors can count them early. Uh, don't wait until the last minute. If you have neighbors who need to change their registration, help them figure out how to do that online now so VoteWA doesn't fail us again, okay? All right, thank you very much, Gail. All right, have a good night, everybody. Okay. Thank you again. Yay! Let's go win! <laughs> okay, Gina, you're back on. Well, that was that was very inspiring. That was great, and uh, I'm glad that she also is uh, values the Voice of America and the uh, various networks. And uh, so we're trying to preserve their integrity, and uh, going to send out some more postcards and such to our our legislators and uh, some that are involved in in those issues. The second item we took a look at was, uh, of course, the Russia, uh, the Russian bounties for Americans and um, coalition groups killing them. Uh, okay, and despite the fact that the in intelligence officials claim that the president was informed and he says he's not, uh, but the president, in any case, doesn't seem to be taking any action against the Russians. And... Uh, well, we figure that Trump probably won't be reading his personal emails, but he deserves to get a full inbox of outrage on this. And so emailing the White House is a, uh, something we can do. And our third and final issue is nuclear testing. And uh, that I'm gonna be doing a, a blast on sometime within the next week, probably. Uh, the Senate Armed, For Armed Services Committee has an approved an amendment from Senator Tom Cotton, uh, Republican of Arkansas, that will make available $10 million to carry out projects related to reducing the time required to execute a nuclear test if necessary. All of which is to say that uh, it looks like they favor nuclear testing if necessary, whatever if necessary means. On the other hand, the House Appropriations Committee has proposed in its spending bill to prohibit funding from being used for nuclear testing. It would, quote, stop the Trump administration from using any funds to carry out its dangerous and short-sighted plans to resume nuclear testing. Okay, so this is an issue again, and we need to um, email our members of Congress and uh, we'll look into more into this to figure out how this will be a good action blast. So please keep an eye open for it and uh, respond. Uh, so that's my report. Okay, so the Jefferson <laughs> County uh, Citizens for Secure Foreign, uh, excuse me, uh, for Sound Foreign Policy, uh, if you want to come to one of our meetings, uh, our next Zoom meeting is slated for the 4th of August at 4 p.m. And my, uh, my name is Gina McMather, so gmcmather at gmail.com uh, if you'd like to get an invitation. Uh, and uh, I send out an email agenda with some background information uh, prior to our discussion and a link to the meeting. So thank you. Thank, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, and, Gina. Uh, Kathleen, are you speaking for immigration? Um, we're very happy that. Um, Bob Ferguson and many people, 17 states have initiated these lawsuits for the whole issue of foreign students having to go back to their countries if they don't have in, you know, in-person education, which of course felt pretty evil and not very productive. And we're, we continue to try to stay informed about what's happening. It, it's really evil that so many people are at such, um, really in such dangerous situation by being in these detention centers. So there's still all these issues that we have to keep pushing for. Um, the latest was, I don't know if people were aware of the asylum law that uh, the administration was trying to push through and you could write a response to it. Actually, the deadline is tomorrow, I believe. And a lot of us did an online information sort of a, a zoom call to help you learn how to write this letter uh, what was really unfortunate is it is so complicated i would love to have just written a lot of my friends to say this is how you write this letter 
but there were so many points. So a lot of us did write that letter. Um, here they had a, a way that essentially is going to pretty much eliminate asylum, which with lots of points of how. Changing the definition of persecution, changing if you traveled through a third country when you came to the United States. So it's, um, it's very disturbing. So we did um, write a response to that, um, but I'm not very helpful or hopeful right now. That's pretty much it, I think. We continue to get support from people, and those of you out who, there who have supported us, we really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Kathleen. Uh, uh, just a, an update, breaking news is that Twitler um, rescinded his order to, uh, to remove the DACA students who aren't participating online. I mean, who aren't participating in person, I'm sorry. Great news! When did, when did that come on? Sometime today, earlier today. Oh, I missed that. Oh, good. I'm here. The New York I'm Times has an article on the foreign students and um, and that that item that that she was just talking about. Yes, go ahead. Okay, I was told I had five to seven minutes. I'm setting my timer, and I'm going to talk really fast. All right, and, not uh, too I, fast. We're old. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll try to talk just fast enough then. Okay. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about the Senate and why we're excited about it. This is kind of a preview. In the coming months, we'll start to do a little deeper dive on some of the races that we really want you to pay attention to. But now's the time to start getting excited, folks. I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully this is all going to come up well. And both Angela, actually Angela and Cheryl and Bruce have a backup copy in case anything fails me. Everybody seeing that okay? Yeah. Okay, there's, there's the Senate. Um, I actually picked an empty picture because right now the Senate is doing more help for us when they're not in session. So let's, uh, let's get rid of the ones that we don't want in there and replace them. Here's the news flash, folks. The Senate is within striking distance. And if someone had told me I would say those words just a few months ago, I would have sworn they were lying. So it's exciting, exciting news. So what, what's going on? Just as background, here's the map. Today we have 53 Republicans and 47 Democrats. Now that does include one of each party that are registered as independent, Ang Angus King in Maine and Bernie Sanders in Vermont. Did someone have a question? Yeah, I thought I heard someone. So take a look at the map. That's where we are today. Those two independents caucus with the Dems and the Republicans respectively. So, of those races, not all of them, of course, are up. We have 100 senators, two for each state. One-third of the Senate is up each, uh, each election cycle. So we have 35 Senate races this time. We actually have a special election in, in at least one, maybe two. In 35 of those Senate races that are up, 23 are in red states. Where there's purple, that means one senator is a Democrat, one senator is a Republican. So let's take a look at the map. You see now in gray, those are states where there are no Senate races up. Example, Washington, neither Senator Cantwell nor Senator Murray are up for election, so we have no Senate races. If you see dark blue below us in Oregon, that means it is a secure Democratic seat or a solid Democratic seat. It would be very unlikely for that state to flip. Go over to Idaho next door to us, that's dark red. That means it's a secure race, unlikely, very unlikely that seat will flip. Where you see the lighter colors, if you go down to light blue New Mexico and lighter blue uh, uh, Texas, and then even farther to the right, you'll see places where there are pink colors. Those mean we're either leaning or likely. So you can just see the gradation. It doesn't, it's not really important that you know all of that just yet. The states I'd love you to focus on are the five that are sort of taupe colored on my screen. They might look mouse brown or more brown or green to you. Those are the states that are toss-up states. So here's the math. If we don't take the White House, in other words, if that wretched man is still in office next year, besides all of us moving to New Zealand or somewhere, 
we would need a net gain of four seats to retake the Senate. And the reason for that is that when there's a tie vote in the Senate, the VP is the tiebreaker. So, of course, the VP would be Pence or whoever else is VP. If we do take the White House, we need a net gain of three seats. So that's the math I want you to keep in mind. So here's the calendar. In January, of all those, those, these Senate seats, the Republican Senate seats where they were up, 13 of those seats were solid Republican. Those would have been deep red if we showed you that map. Four were likely, two were leaning, and we had three that were toss-ups. In January, when the, the group of us that followed the Senate gave our report to the elections team, these were the words we used. We said it will be an uphill battle to retake the Senate. And the Democrats would need to hold Alabama, which is unlikely. I'll talk about that. We would need to pick up the White House and flip all three of those toss-ups. So Alabama is a Democrat. It's Doug Jones. He is the most vulnerable Democrat. And it is very unlikely we will hold that seat. So that's what would have to have happened in January for us to retake the Senate. So here's what's going on in July. No longer are there 13 solid Republican seats. There are 10. You can see the likelies are still four. Leans went from two to four. And toss-ups went from three to five. So three Republican toss-up seats in January. Now there are five. Retaking the Senate is a real possibility, even if we lose Doug Jones. And Tommy, <laughs> Jeff Sessions and Tommy Tuberville or Tuberville Angel, I can never remember. <laughs> he's he's by far uh, ahead. So Tuberville, he like, Tuberville. Okay, T Tuberville will like. He's a former football coach. Um, okay, uh, toss up. I call this toss blue. What's going on? GOP is on the run in several Republican states. They are almost all of their spending is defensive, which is great. Five Republican Senate seats have shifted in our direction just in the last two months. That's really, really extraordinary. Democrats are seriously out fundraising Republicans. Trump's mishandling of coronavirus and all the other issues, whether it's Black Lives Matter or really anything else the man does, are driving these trends. The governor's trust in several of these states is polling higher than senators. So that's really important. Trump is getting dragged down. The senator's getting dragged down by Trump because they're defending him or they're being silent. They're complicit. Um, along those lines, please check out the Lincoln Project ads. They are phenomenal. There's a wonderful one out now that really nails McConnell, Cruz, Graham, all of these folks, uh, Collins, that, that have just been so complicit in Trump. Okay, if the election were held today, I would be jumping up and down. We actually have 112 days, so we're not there yet. Lots can happen, but it is just phenomenal that we're, we're getting this far along. Let's take a look at these states real quickly. Uh, just going to flash them. We'll spend more time on these at, at next meetings. Martha McSally in Arizona, she's a first-termer. She's running against Mark Kelly, former astronaut. You also may recognize that name. He is the husband of Gabby Giffords, who is the um, Congresswoman who was, uh, was wounded seriously in the uh, gunfire. Uh, right now, the polls are anywhere from two and a half to even six percent. I've seen some polls as high as six. I'm calling it at four percent today for Kelly. Colorado, Cory Gardner, another first termer, um, up against a very popular uh, former Denver mayor and former Colorado governor, Jan Hickenlooper. Um, some polls show him up as high as 13 percent. You know, I'm not going to believe that yet, but he's by far leading in these five in terms of the toss-up states, in terms of the most gain. Maine, Senator Susan Collins, they had a primary today. I, their polls are closed now, I believe. Um, I, think they, I think they closed at eight or nine. In all likelihood, Sarah Gideon, she's going to be the, the contender. Um, she's a current House Speaker. Uh, Gideon is polling at least two and a half percent above Susan Collins. She's polling well with women, with Susan Collins always used to poll well with women, and independence. Gideon's polling away. Montana, Steve Dane's another first termer against popular Governor Steve Bullock. Bullock is up two percent. That's exciting. North Carolina, Tom Tillis, another first termer against Cal Hunt Cunningham. Um, Cunningham got a lot to his background. We can talk more about him later. Um, Lots of good stuff in his background, pulling uh, about four, almost 4% 4 above. So reverse the Trump agenda is what Indivisible is all about. To me, that means reverse the Senate. As much as I want that orange man out of the White House, I am passionate about the Senate. Supreme Court justices, um, 
Justice Ginsburg, Ginsburg, bless her heart, uh, still fighting, but you know she's back in the hospital today. Uh, she she is not going to live forever, despite what we all think she might. And all of the lower court justices, court of appeals judges and district court judges, that the Senate approves, women's reproductive rights, the environment, health care, all these issues, the Senate is in, is such a big player in social justice issues, cabinet appointees, ambassadorships. All right, just about everything. <laughs> so that's why reversing the Trump agenda means reversing the Senate, retaking the Senate. Just a quick scan of some headlines. They're making the GOP nervous. I'll let you scan those real fast because I'm mindful of time and I have exactly 40 seconds to finish <laughs> on time. So actions, what can you do? First of all, please focus on those five toss-up races, Arizona, Colorado, Maine, Montana, and North Carolina. We'll track those for you. That's what the elections group does. We'll let you know if those change, but right now those are toss-ups. I think those are going to be really strong to the end. Also watch, there are six leaning races. So leaning, you know, they could go too. So Alabama, Georgia, Georgia, two races in Georgia because of a, a, a retiree for health issues, Iowa, Kansas, and Michigan. That Michigan, that Michigan Senate seat is Gary Peters. Um, he is a Democrat that we want to support. Please share info about these important races with your friends and relatives in key states. Donate if you can now and later. Um, we know that donating is not in everybody's capability. We get that. We understand completely. There are lots of ways you can think about this. You can say, I want to donate now because it's early money that helps some of these candidates. A lot of people at this close juncture will get four months, say, I'm going to set aside 25% now and 25% for that last 30 days, and I'll split the rest in between. There are lots of strategies. I'm happy to talk with you more about it. I'm happy to give you my opinion about which of these races are the most important ones. Honestly, all five of these are so important. Right now, um, there's lots of other th places to give money to, we know, but really, change in the Senate is really, really critical for all of us. So um, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, take my last uh, 10 seconds I think I have to see if anybody else has uh, anything on the elections team. There are several other folks that are with me tracking the Senate. If, if I missed anything, please jump in. Yeah, Jackie. Well, uh, my two states are Alaska and Iowa, and things are changing fast, even right. in Alaska, believe it or not. Yep. Dan Sullivan is one of their uh, sen two senators. He is going down, I mean, in the polls, and um, they have one representative, and I think he's going to, I think he's going to go down. So these are exciting races, and Iowa, Joni Ernst is really not popular in Iowa. Yeah, she's in that leading category, so things are changing so quickly. And Trump being Trump is helping us, and it's helping in these Senate races. So that's why my strategy, and everybody's got a different strategy, some money now, hold some money back for later. But, you know, really, I'm, I'm keeping some out every month to see what's shifting and who needs that help because things are moving quickly. And, you know, things are going to be different in four months, but I have a hard time imagining it's going to be all sweetness and roses with the economy. We know it's not going to be with coronavirus. The man has cost people's lives. Mike. Yeah, Renee, uh, I saw some recent, because I've been supporting Amy McGrath now for years. Uh, recent polling data shows her in a dead heat with Mitch McConnell. I know that would be almost miraculous, but uh, that's also very encouraging. Uh, so uh, there may be a lot more seats at stake here uh, than we thought. And I also know that uh, the competitor, uh, and now I forget his name, uh, against Lindsey Graham has been out raising him yeah. in money. So uh, <clears throat> the enthusiasm gap is right there uh, for everybody to see, and I hope it holds all the way for the next three and a half months. Thank Mike, you. Right. Mike, there's, 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 a a couple, there's a couple of questions um, on the chat. One of them was, uh, what about Kentucky? And the other one is, what percentage, wait a minute, what percentage of our donations would you suggest putting towards Senate races versus the presidential race? And both of those questions are for um, Renee. Yeah, so um, Kentucky is definitely something to watch. Um, 
he is, McConnell is one of the least popular senators. But he's not yet, you know, he's still not over in that toss up. He's got a ways to go. But I think things are changing very quickly. I would keep watching that. I would definitely keep watching South Carolina. The good news is that when the Grams and the McConnells become less popular, they have to spend money defensively. Defensive spending is really great. We want those Republicans to have to spend all their money on defensive sure. ads. Um, so it's really, it's really great. So I, I, we, we have to watch those. But as of today, and I try not to look at the polls until like a couple of weeks at a time because things can shift so quickly. Um, as in, in terms of presidential versus Senate, everybody's going to have to make their own choice on that. Um, I, know, I know for me and for many women I know, the Senate is almost more important. But they're, both, they're equal. They're equal. So that's, a, that's something you have to figure out for yourself. As, uh, that's a personal thing. Me too. Hey, thank you, Debbie, for bringing those up because uh -huh. I look at the chat and I want to thank everybody that uh, participated in this. And um, this is really great. And we're going to do it next month on the 11th of August. We're going to have a presentation from someone who's got a really cool thing that. Uh, uh, the SQUIM uh, chapter has been using, and we may have a candidate also. So we'll let you know uh, via our website, via BLAST. But uh, thank you for coming, and I hope you found it informative. Thank you.